G'day, welcome to Bootlosophy. My name is Tech, and I'm coming to you from Wajit country in Western Australia and I acknowledge the traditional owners of this land. Today I'm going to be reviewing Timberland's eco-conscious boot, the original 6-inch leather earthkeeper boots. This is the Timberland original 6-inch leather Earthkeeper boots. While Timberland now offers a range of products under the copyrighted Earthkeeper's name, this was their first Earthkeeper's boot. If you're interested in boots, wherever you are in the world, and you haven't heard of Timberland, I guess your name might be Rip Van Winkle. Timberland was founded in 1928 in Boston, Massachusetts in the United States, and originally called the Abingdon Shoe Company. In 1952, Nathan Schwartz uh, bought an interest in the company and eventually took over the remaining shares and made it a family business before moving it to New Hampshire. It first focused on producing waterproof boots capable of withstanding the winters of that region. Timberland boots proved popular with industrial workers as well as on college campuses and sold well at high-end retailers. The popularity of the boots prompted the Schwartzes to discontinue manufacturing for other shoe brands and then concentrate on expanding their own brand. In 1978, the company was renamed the Timberland Company after the name of their most popular iconic model, the classic yellow 6-inch Timberland boot. They continued to expand their range of waterproof boots and shoes, as well as introducing men's and women's clothing and accessories. In 1987, Timberland went public and was listed on the New York Stock Exchange. In 2011, Timberland was acquired by the VF Corporation, a global lifestyle and footwear company that also owns brands like North Face, uh, Dickies, Icebreaker, and many, many others that you've heard of. Today, all of its product is made in world markets with factories ranging from uh, South America to Asia and to Europe. Timberland has been estimated to be worth $1.58 billion in 2017, with revenue of about $1.4 billion, and it employed over 2,000 employees in the United States and about 3,500 overseas. So it's not a small batch handmade manufacturer of boots. My first heritage style work boot was the classic 6-inch yellow waterproof boot which I first bought 30 years ago, and you can see my review of my current version up here. This is the original 6-inch leather Earthkeepers. There's a necessary long-windedness in that name. First, the word original must be used because this is their first Earthkeepers uh, and their first production of an eco-conscious boot. Second, the word leather is in there because there are other Earthkeeper boots and, and shoes uh, that are not all made of leather. So this must be called the original 6-inch leather Earthkeeper boots. <laughs> What makes it eco-conscious? Well, in 2007, Timberland decided to produce a boot with all the usual waterproof characteristics and rubber bond welted soles, but with sustainable materials. So, this is made from sustainable materials, including 50% recycled PET linings and laces, recycled from plastic bottles, 34% recycled rubber outsoles, and leathers outsourced from uh, gold or silver rated tanneries. I should state up front that I bought these from eBay for 50 Aussie dollars, or I probably would not have bought a pair of these at all. I wasn't particularly in love with the aesthetic, but I thought for 50 dollars I should at least try it out, seeing as how I love my classic yellow boots and some other of my Timberland boots. I believe they were seconds rather than used because the sole and the heels are untouched and the leather looked new, but there are some gouges uh, on one of the quarters which looked like a machine problem and they'd been fixed by a cobbler using a little glue and dye. So as I said, I didn't really like the aesthetic. I thought the squared off toe cap uh, has a kind of weird mock toe aesthetic combined with the stitching everywhere, uh, especially around the bottom of the panels, making it look like a Frankenstein monster. There's something like 15 different pieces of leather in this. The funny thing is that my wife who usually likes my sleek and slim boots, thought it was different and interesting enough to be likeable. <laughs> I've got used to them now, but I still think they're a cross between the looks of a mock toe and a work boot, 
and maybe a bit of a hunter's boot thrown in, especially in this medium brown. I wasn't aware until I was researching for this video, but it comes in 10 different colors. Uh, this is their most popular medium brown version. It's a distress. Red brown comes with it, black, wheat, burnished gold, gray, dark brown burnished oil, uh, two shades of dark brown, and something called cactus full grain. You wouldn't class these as service boots or combat boots, and calling them a work boot aesthetic uh, isn't quite right. But if you twist my arm, I'd say they have an outdoors aesthetic. I don't think you'd disagree. These are strictly casual boots, and in that rugged outdoors casual, builder's yard, workplace casual kind of aesthetic. So pair them with jeans and, a, and canvas work pants, uh, fleecy shirts and rugged jumpers and jackets and all that sort of thing. One thing though, while work booty in look may be, these are not work boots. They're just a little too soft and unprotected. Hiking, a little work in the yard, looking stylish leaning at the bar counter, yeah. Going logging, mm, not so much. Let's look at how they are made, and as usual, we'll start at the bottom and work our way up. They stand on a rubber, commando pattern lugged sole. It's a pretty soft rubber. It's Timberland's uh, trademarked grip stick rubber sole. Pretty good shock absorption. The lugs in that familiar commando style pattern, you know, radiating lugs and star-shaped studs in the center, they're quite grippy under most conditions. There is a rubber midsole and a welt and it's attached to the uppers in a bond welt style of construction. Bond welt is a form of cement construction. A strip of material like a welt is glued to the insole, which is itself attached to the uppers. And then the welt and the insole is glued or heat sealed to the outsole. The stitches you see on top of the welt are real. Let me be clear, it's not a real welted construction. It uses the welt here as a medium for cementing. In this case, the welt used is leather, and the midsole is a compression molded EVA foam for cushioning. Resoling is probably easier than a merely heat attached rubber sole like in their classic yellow boot. But I guess you can peel off the outsole and midsole easily and glue new ones on, I think. I don't think there's a shank. Uh, that piece of hard material that's usually inserted inside the boot to give arch support and stability. It's just a little too light and flexible, I think. If it does have a shank, it's a pretty flexible nylon shank, which in my opinion might as well not be there. Inside is a cardboard footbed, and on top of that, they place a removable uh, anti-fatigue trademark footbed, which is pretty comfortable. The leather is full grain, waxed or oiled nubuck, uh, less corrected or sanded down than the yellow nubuck boots. They scuff quite easily, uh, mainly the wax scratching on the surface, and it's easy to rub it out with your thumb. Despite all the stitching everywhere, all around the bottom of the panels, here, along the quarters, uh, up the back stay, despite all this very busy stitching, it is waterproof. The leather is treated and the inside of the boot is lined with a waterproof material behind all the stitching, as well as with a waterproof fabric, also uh, made from recycled plastic bottles. The medium brown leather is actually quite nice. It's about two mils thick and is soft and supple. It's very comfortable, but as I said earlier, I think a little too supple to stand as a knockabout work boot. I feel that if I dropped a heavy span on my toe, I'd feel it, especially as it's not a structured toe. Uh, it's very soft. At least that's what I think. If you use it as a work boot, let me know in the comments below. The oily, waxy feel is reminiscent of crazy horse leather, like on the Chippewa service boots, or like Red Wing's uh, copper rough and tough leather. There's not a lot of structure in the toes or in the heels. As I said, the toe box has this mock toe look. I'm not sure you wouldn't call it a mock toe, but I'm not sure you would either. Um, let's just call it a Frankenstein monster toe. <laughs> um, there's a lot of stitching in there. The back stay up the heel, that's a puzzle. It has a couple of loops sewn into it, which I don't think has any function at all. There's the usual Timberland logo stamped into the side of the heel, which I quite like, even though some people uh, really don't like logos on their boots. Moving on, it has nine generously sized nickel colored eyelets, uh, no speed hooks. I usually lace uh, uh, only up to eight eyelets because that ninth one is pretty high up on the facings. The laces, the laces are great. They're also made of recycled material. They're thick but soft and they're 
tie very well. They, they stay tied when you tie them. The tongue is ungusseted, which is very surprising for a Timberland waterproof boot. The leather might be waterproof, but I would have thought you need at least partially gusseted tongue to keep the high water line high. However, having said that, I have run through a downpour and into uh, deep rain puddles, and I've not got my feet wet. At the very top, the collar is lightly padded and rolled, which makes it very comfortable uh, to tie up tight. As a waxed or oiled new buck, it doesn't demand much leather care. It's been waterproofed, I think, at the tannery, and so doesn't need anything in boot oils. Uh, as you know by now, if you're a subscriber, I usually recommend that you check out what the manufacturer says about caring for your boots, and then you follow their recommendation, uh, unless you're an experienced and, and uh, a boot collector and you really know what you're doing. In this case, Timberland's recommendations are a bit confusing. Of course, when dealing with new buck, they recommend their new buck and suede cleaners and conditioners. But in this case, I think I'd follow the care instructions of what they call waxed or oiled leathers. The waxiness uh, already applied to these mean that the Renew Buck product you use on their yellow new buck boots won't be optimal here. In caring for their waxed or oiled leathers, they recommend their Waximum Waxed Leather Protector. It's a balm that comes in a tin. You clean the leather with a clean damp cloth, leave it to dry, and then apply the Waximum balm, working it into the leather and making sure you get into the many seams. <laughs> Allow it to dry and then brush or buff any excess with a dry cloth. The leather is a matte appearance, so uh, no shining up is necessary. The water repellency can wear off apparently, so if you feel you need to replenish a protective layer over and above your Waximum Balm, you can use their Balm Proofer All-Purpose Protector Spray. Just pump spray over the boots at a distance of 6 to 8 inches, that's 15-20 centimeters, and cover the boots with a fine mist. Allow it to dry. And off you go. I reckon under normal use conditions, doing this every four to six months is more than enough. I'll put links to where you can get these products in the description below. They are affiliate links, but you don't pay any more because of that. And if you want to get the products anyway, it helps me make about 50 cents a purchase. <laughs> I haven't actually conditioned these, by the way. Uh, I haven't felt like they needed to. They're still pretty waxy. I have washed them under a tap though when they got muddy in a walk and the water just rolled off and just took the mud away. So all in all, I think a pretty easy boot to take care of. Now, taking a look at um, fit and sizing. My true to size, as measured by a Brannock device, is eight and a half in D width in US sizing. The equivalent UK or Aussie sizing is seven and a half in G or average width. But I'll stick to talking in US sizes because being a US product, it's just a bit easier. Usually, in almost all my heritage style American boots, they run a half size large and I buy 8D instead of 8.5D. In the Timberland original classic yellow new but waterproof boot, I wear an 8 wide. Timberland only offers two widths, average and wide. Uh, that was a good fit in that model. These are also an 8 wide, but in these, maybe it's the last or maybe uh, it's the lack of structure, they feel a little roomy. I think I could have probably fitted into an 8 average or even a 7.5 wide. I like having room for my toes, so uh, probably a 7.5 wide, I think. These are not going to fly off my feet, they're not that loose. But sometimes when I'm walking fast, my feet get a little tired because the toes inside feel like they're constantly scrabbling to try and get a grip as I walk. To make that better, I put a piece of hard foam under their uh, mold at anti-fatigue removable insole. That's barked it up enough to take uh, up the volume. The fit, considering that I've just said it's a little loose, is better with the extra foam and around the ankles it's pretty good. Their anti-fatigue footbed is really quite comfy as it's almost taken the job of uh, impressing the shape of your feet into a leather and cork footbed. The lack of shank is not a huge problem, mainly because the molded rubber heel is sitting quite low so there's no big flexing under the arch. The rubber heel and sole is very shock absorbing, so that's good. The leather is supple, more supple than the yellow Tims, and uh, where those are stiffened by stiffeners in the toes and heels, these are very sparing in anything stiffening, so feels like it's a softer set of uppers, like a pair of shoes. As for the comfort in the break-in, remember these are from eBay. 
even though I think these are unworn seconds, not second hand, remembering that there was no break in and honestly, uh, everything is so soft, even these multiple seams, that I think even if brand new, there'd be no break in issues whatsoever if you size right. Okay, time to look at cost and value. I got these for Aussie $50 on eBay. <laughs> that was the starting bid and nobody else came in. The owner was very honest and described and showed photos of the gouge in the leather. Uh, to be honest, I didn't really want them. I put in the first bid at $50 thinking um, I'd be outbid and what fun it was. I then fell off my chair when I actually won the auction. Anyway, I don't wear these as much because they're probably and objectively not my favorites in my collection. I have to consciously decide to wear them rather than automatically grab them like many others in my collection. But despite that, I'm glad I did win them at $50 and the value at $50 is insanely unbeatable. But what about new? They sell for US $160 and in Australia sell for just under 300 Aussie dollars. On Amazon, you can get them new for between 130 to 160 US dollars. Now, remembering they are a welted and cemented boot, waterproof, nice leather, uses recycled materials if that's important to you. At 130 to 160 dollars, it's a pretty fair price. You get a very unique looking boot for that price. I think that US 130 to 160 will reflect their value considering I've heard uh, people have worn these as everyday boots for two or three years before they're either discarded or they attempt a resole. That's 50 to $75 per year of wear. To be honest, if it lasts you two or three years and you're looking at a resole that might cost half the original price, I'd be happy just getting a new pair every two or three years of everyday wear. QC, well, these are hardly handmade boots. But with machinery, theoretically, you can control QC much better and large corporations with large factories do implement strong QC inspection and process control procedures. I can't see any QC issues other than that aforesaid gouge, which was obviously picked up and I haven't heard of QC issues out of the box from other reviewers or other boot groups either. For 300 Australian dollars though, the exchange rate isn't that bad. At Aussie 300, I think they're overpriced and probably priced as a fashion item, not a fair value priced boot. If you live in Australia and want a pair, I recommend getting on the Amazon US site because even with the exchange rate and shipping, they'll be about mid $200. And on Amazon, you can get free shipping and free returns, especially if you're a Prime member. So there you go, guys. My review of the Timberland original six inch Earthkeeper leather boots. I hope you liked the review. Say, so even if you're a subscriber, I'd be very grateful if you clicked on the like button. Subscribers are reminded of my videos when they come out, and so sometimes forget to click on like because they're already watching. So don't forget to click on like uh, to help me grow this channel. Of course, if you're new to this channel, click on both like and subscribe. Why don't you? I'm going to bring you more objective boot reviews, a few unboxing videos as I buy new boots, and sometimes a few reviews of other things like bags and leather goods. So if you don't want to miss them, click on subscribe and YouTube will tell you when I upload new videos. Until then guys, take care and I'll see you then.